This workshop will be a practical introduction to Haskell Gadgets, um, and and sort of before a lot of the the introductory matter, I just want to draw everyone's attention to these instructions up here. Um, uh, there are some dependencies for the last exercise that we'll be doing during the workshop. Um, they shouldn't take very long to do, so um, I mean, if you start them now, it should only probably take 10 minutes or so for all that to compile. Um, but uh, you might as well get started now so, so people can, can go off and do that. Um, so thanks very much for, for coming today. Let me start off sort of introducing myself a little bit. I am a, um, a fourth year, I guess starting my fifth year soon, uh, grad student at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, I, spend, I spend sort of a lot of my time uh, thinking about these languages, right? These are, are sort of the you know, three big dependently typed languages that I like to think about. Um, out of curiosity, how many of you were at the Idris talk this morning? Wow, OK, cool. Um, so uh, I don't think we had a sort of a way of knowing this until after it all happened. But I think this workshop is the workshop that it'll end where that one began a little bit. And so if, if some of you have some questions lingering, especially from the sort of the beginning of the, about the equality, it's, it's actually very closely related to what we'll be doing in this, um, and so that they might link up. Um, anyway, so I think about these languages, um, but I think a lot more about this one. And, um, and what I'm, what I'm, my whole research agenda is figuring out how to get the dependent types into Haskell. Um, and so, uh, again, as a counterpoint to, to Brian's workshop this morning, so Brian was talking about how one of the nice things about Idris is that it's simpler um, because it was sort of built from the ground up with dependent types. That's certainly something I agree with. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not a place for it also in Haskell. There's, there's, uh, these are different languages. They have different ways of working um, and um, different type inference characteristics. And so, so I'm really looking at sort of how to do dependent types in Haskell. Uh, things are going fairly well. Um, we're going to have a, uh, with the release of 7.12, there's going to be sort of a big step in this direction. And then with, with 7.14, um, which would be, I guess, in sort of late winter 2017, we might actually have real dependent types in Haskell. Um, and so that's, that's at least my hope. Um, OK, but we're not going to talk really that much about dependent types uh, today, because we're just going to start sort of at the, at the shallow end of that with Gaddits. Um, but before we even get there, let me learn a little bit more about my audience. So before we get to the, the items I hear, how many of you have programmed in Haskell before? Okay, awesome. Um, uh, how many of you have used Gadgets before? Oh, okay, so 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 you. So, okay, I, I know I haven't even defined my term yet. There is a there is a Haskell extension spelled exactly like this. And so if you've, if you've programmed in a Haskell file with that extension on, so we can sort of start there. Um, so how many people have, have programmed with that extension on? OK. Um, if you don't know what these terms are, that's OK. This is just sort of get, some, get an idea of where everyone is. How many of you have used promoted data types, the new data kinds extension? No one. OK, OK, a little bit. Um, type families, a little bit. Singletons, no one. OK. How many of you have programmed in these languages not counting the workshop this morning? <laughs> OK. Um, so so that, that's sort of what I expect. A lot of people who have done some Haskell, but maybe not use a lot of these features. And, and, and like I said, that really is OK. I'm not expecting you know, people to even know those. So let me also line out the goals of this talk. Um, I would like, by the end of this, for you to understand the basic mechanics of how Gadgets work um, and to be able to sort of work with them a little bit. Um, and probably most importantly, understand why they're really cool and why you might want them. Um, what, what this talk will not be able to deliver on is, the idea, is, is being able to walk out of this room and being able to take some code base that exists and say, wow, I'm going to use gadgets all over the place now and it's going to work even so much better than it does today. That takes a long time to build up that level of skill. We're not going to get that far today. And so we're going to be working with a code base that already has a lot of gadgets in it and and it, I'm not expecting you to be able to sort of design that from the ground up just after these two hours. OK, so finally, what is a GAT? A GAT is a generalized algebraic data type. That's what the letters stand for. Um, there's, I don't find that there's all that much meaning that you can plumb from these words, though. <laughs> so I'm just going to keep calling it a GAT, it, and it's just a thing. Um, and we'll see what it is. And that's what the words stand for. 
Um, the idea is, is that we're taking the data types that we already know, um, something like the maybe type that, we, that everyone uses, right? And, and we're generalizing that in a certain way, and we'll see how that works. But again, there's not all that much you can pull out of these words. Um, so right away, the, the, the interesting thing that GADITs allow us to do is they give us more compile time checks than normal ADTs. So uh, Haskell programmers like to you know, tout that maybe is so much better than null, right? You know, Java's null, because you have to always check if a maybe is nothing before you extract the data out of it. So this gives you greater compile time checking. Um, GAD is just sort of bring that one step further, right? And so we, we're, we're used to how in Haskell our types give us more compile time surety that our code works. And again, GAD is just one, one further step in that same direction of travel. And so if you liked going from one of these languages down here to Haskell, you might also like GADITs. Um, okay, the, the sort of the domain of study that we're going to consider today is a, uh, a lambda calculus interpreter that I've called Glamda, um, not only because it's glamorous, but because it uses GADITs. Um, and this is a simply typed lambda calculus. We're going to see a demonstration of it sort of toward the end, but the idea is, is that we're going to be building up this interpreter in Haskell um, that, that interprets this other language. And, you know, you could ask, well, you know, this is, this is entitled a practical introduction. Is this practical? Um, well, Philip Greenspun says, yes, it is practical. Um, and, and when you think about it, large programs do contain another programming language inside of it, right? You think of, of word processors. There's a macro language hidden in there. Um, uh, you know, a text, Emacs has its own very fully blown, glorified programming language inside of it. Spreadsheets have programming languages inside of them. Games often have sort of mod packages that you can program in. And so this is, this is practical in that way. Um, but beyond just those applications, Gadgets have other applications as well. Um, you can, in, in just the same way that we're going to be building sort of a type safe um, Lambda calculus interpreter today, um, you can also use it to do type safe database access. So you can, you can have sort of your program check its types against um, uh, an SQL schema. Um, you, can do the, you can use GADITs to have verified data structures. So there's at the end of the talk um, on, on the last slide, there's a link to a tutorial about how to build a verified binary tree that is always balanced. That if you try to unbalance it, your program won't compile. Um, uh, GADITs can be used for generic programming so that you can um, uh, sort of do a little bit of dynamic checking in your, in your program and still have that be type safe. Um, and tagless programming, so it's a little hard to explain. It's a way of sort of making, making programs actually a little bit faster. This is, this is an efficiency thing. Um, okay, so let's, let's actually see our first live GADIT. So I'm going to jump off to Emacs. Where is it? Okay. So uh, here I am. I will be typing right into this. We're going to be writing. Whoops, that's not the, what I say. I say language first. Okay, so we first have to turn on the GADITS extension to Haskell. Um, and then the obligatory that. Module header, does this compile? Is my system working? Maybe. I certainly hope so. There we go. Um, you'll see here that I'm using the new GHC 710. Um, that's not really necessary. Gadgets have been around for a long time. Um, I don't think there's really anything I'm talking about in this talk that wouldn't work as far back as 7.4. Some of the stuff that, that, is, that I'm using does require 7.4, though. Um, so let's write a Gadget, and then I'll explain how this works and why it's called STI. Okay, does that compile? Yes, it does. So, so there's a couple of, of weird things going on here. Um, the first is the syntax. Um, by raise of hand, how many people have seen and sort of understand this syntax? What's going on here? Okay, so that's, I'd say that's most, most people. Um, what, what's going on here is that, so we have two different constructors um, to a data type S tie, right? This isn't all that different from a normal data declaration, except that Instead of just saying that the two constructors are s int and s bool, neither of which take any arguments, I'm actually describing what the return types are of each of these constructors. So 
when, when, in, when you define a maybe type, let me, let me just write in the declaration for maybe by, so we have comparison here. Whoops. Um, so in a, in a maybe type, we have these two constructors just and nothing. And we say what arguments they take, but we don't say anything about what they return because we know that they just return a maybe A. Well, with a get, it, that, this is the generalization. We've generalized that to say an s int doesn't return an s tie of any type tie. It always returns an s tie of int. Um, and uh, s bool will always give us an s tie bool. And what that allows us to do is in this zero function, oh, I, why did I say five? There should be zero, of course. Um, is I can say, I can add, use the zero function to get a zero of the type that I give it. So the reason that this is called s tie is because this, this is actually a singleton type um, in that if I have an s tie int, then the only possible value I can have is s int. Um, and if I have an s tie bool, the only possible value I can have is s bool. The fact that it's a singleton isn't really all that important for now. That's just, the only reason I'm really saying that is to motivate why there's all these s's around. Um, so with, with this, we can actually write this sort of more, more interesting function zero and the return values of these two different clauses are different, or the return types of, of the different clauses are different. Right? In one, I'm returning zero, a number, and then the other, false, and yet this still type checks. Right? We can't normally do things like this in Haskell, um, at least not without gadgets. So let me add, um, actually, I don't even need to do that. Let's, let's switch back to, to Keynote for a sec. And, and by the way, uh, I'd love this to be interactive, so if there's questions, please raise your hand. I'll, let me pause now. Are there questions? Yes. Okay. So what does what does um, what, what's the type of zero? So, so I mean on the on the right side of the arrow. So what does what does S D Y tie mm -hmm. return a tie? So so this is I mean this is just a. Um, I mean S tie is a, sort of an indexed type. It's it's sort of like maybe in that it's you know we have the name of the type s tie, and then it's given some parameter. Um, and, and so just like you could have a function maybe a arrow a, that's, that's sort of what okay. the way that this is written. Does that answer your question? OK. All right. Other questions? Yes? Could you please elaborate on how it's not possible to behave with regular transforms? Sure. Um, so if. Um, whoops, that doesn't make any sense. So if I try to compile this, I get an error um, that says that I can't match this type A with bool, right? In the second clause there, I said I want to return a bool, but Haskell is expecting me to return something of any type A. Um, and the difference is, is that with zero, by doing a pattern match, I've learned something about that type index tie. I've learned that it has to be bool. Um, and so, so let, me, let me go from, from here over to back, back, back to Kino to sort of explain a little bit more about what's going on in this example. Um, and so here, here's the same example. I, it's also extended with maybe. Um, and what, what, what we can do here is when, when we pattern match, we learn something about tie. So in, in particular, after I've pattern matched against s int, we see here that that, that index tie has to be int, right? Because I, we see up, up toward the top here that, well, an s int can only be an s tie of int. Right, we've, we've labeled the return type in, the, in our syntax here. So that means that when I pattern match, I learn that tie is, is int. And so that means that returning 0 is, is the correct, it has the, or the value 0 has the correct type there. Because I know if tie is int, that tie is int. On the next line, by pattern matching against s bool, I learn in that clause that tie must be bool. And so producing a return value of false is just fine. 
There we go. Um, down here, I learned that tie has to be maybe of something, and so I can return nothing. And so by, by doing my pattern match, I get that information out. Yes? I have two questions. I'll play them real quick. So before you added S maybe, the TY parameter was a phantom, made a phantom type, right? And then <coughs> can you pattern match in like a case expression and have the same result where the return, you know, what's on the right hand side? Or, okay. Yeah, yeah, this, this works just as well in a case as it does in, in a sort of a function pattern match. And did, was there another question? No, that was okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Y yes? So, so is, it, is this a way to make a function to return different type? Yes. Okay. That's, that's one thing it can do, and that's, that's an important thing it can do. Yes? Um, so so this, this still, I, I realize this may be a little confusing, so I'm, now I'm going to take the exact same information and present it in a, a slightly different way, and maybe if, if some people are struggling a little bit, that might capture you. So here I've written this is the exact same type. It's just using a different syntax. Um, and so here I'm not using this where syntax. I'm using sort of the more traditional data type declaration syntax that, that Haskell has had for a long time. And, and what it's saying is, is that to call the sint constructor, to be able to build an sint, I need to satisfy the constraint that tie equals int. So this twiddle, we saw this on the last slide too, that's just Haskell's notation for type equality. So when I say um, to the left of that double arrow that tie equals int, that means I can only use sint when I know that tie equals int. I can only use s bool when I know that tie equals bool, and I can only use s maybe when I know that tie is maybe of something. So, so in other words, if you want to have implementation of zero s int, and you would say int equals to an of string, then you have to compile error. That's, that's exactly right, yes. Yeah, if, if I did anything else sort of on the right hand side, any other types, I'd get errors. This is, this is not making sort of Haskell dynamically typed. It's just sort of allowing us to make decisions and, and have different types in different clauses, yes. Um, dropping. I don't know. So it, it, it is in some sense because nothing, it doesn't really matter what it's a maybe of because nothing works at any type. That's what I mean in the, in the constructor. Uh, when you pattern match on Yes, it does. That's a great question. Yes. So, so S maybe, this is sort of going in a different direction than we're going to focus on today, but S maybe is also an exist, it's called an existential data constructor in that it sort of does package up this tie prime with it. And when you pattern match, you get that back out. Um, yes? Aside from the more verbose notation, does this lose some power or does this have the exact same functionality as the previous? This is identical in every way. And in fact, you'll need to, you would need to enable the Gattis extension to write this. Um, this and, and internally within GHC, it, it actually converts the other syntax to this. Um, Are you saying the, 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 what do you call that, the type? Twiddle. Twiddle. Yeah. It's enabled with the GADT extension. It's, it's enabled with the GADT's extension or the type family's extension. So I, I actually guess you could, there's, you could probably come up with some list of extensions that would get this to work that didn't include Gadgets, which is probably a mistake. Um, okay, so the other thing with these constrained constructors, yes? Sorry, should the S maybe case work? It doesn't take an argument, so it's still in the same way. I had to remove the, and that's with the, that version, the D-sugar GHC? Oh, you know what, you're right. Yes, it should be maybe um, s tie of tie prime. Yes, you're right. Yes, that's a that's a bug in the slide. Thank you. Um, I can't really sort of edit it very easily, but um, yeah, the it should be after that double arrow. Oh. Where, oh, no, I think that bigger. 
<laughs> right. Yes, that's not cut off. That's actually just my mistake. But that's what, if, if you write that, it should hopefully work. Can anyone report back that it works? Great. Oh. Yeah, that, actually, that would work fine, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to be equivalent to the previous slide, yeah. Um, so, so with these constrained constructors that we see here, with constructors with sort of constraints uh, to the left of the double arrow, when you pattern match on the constructors, you get those constraints back, and you can use them. And so that means that here, after pattern matching on sint, we learn that tie is int. And here we learn that tie is bool, and here we learn that tie is a maybe. So it's exactly the same behavior, and we can just think of these constraints as being becoming available after the pattern match. And it turns out that constrained constructors are useful beyond just gadgets here with, with, with sort of equality constraints. Um, you can package, say, a show constraint in, in uh, a data type and then unpack it by a pattern match, which can sometimes be useful. Um, okay. Uh, so the, the, the takeaway from this whole section is that pattern matching a term gives type level information. So the, the pattern matching is still on terms, things that are around at runtime. Right? Any sort of pattern match has to be against something that's going to be around when your program is running because a pattern match is a decision that your program is making. But in the context of that match, you get type level information, which allows your types to sort of be a little bit different on the right-hand side of that pattern match. And that's, that is the power of Gaddits. Um, it's that these sort of runtime decisions can affect compile time information. Um, okay, so with that, it's time for you to take this and extend it a little bit. Um, and it, there's instructions there. Um, that, will, that brings you to sort of the front page of the GitHub repo. You can scroll down and, um, and click on exercise one, which has all the details there. So. Let's uh, get to work. Maybe I don't know six or seven minutes, and we'll reconvene. Here, but let's let's go over the solution. I think we'll start with wrap. So walking around, I saw I saw people get sort of this part pretty good because that's very similar to the maybe case, which I know isn't up here. I guess I'll throw that in just for completeness. And then if we get a wrap here, well, now we're a little bit stuck, right? We don't, we don't sort of have a zero element of this type. So uh, the idea may be not very clearly stated anywhere, but sort of w w what can we do? There's sort of only one thing we can do at this point. We want to wrap something. So we know we're going to have to call the wrap constructor. And now we need the zero element of, of A, of sort of the thing inside. Well, so we just use recursion. And then, oh, that's, that's from this won't work. I'm getting errors. It still doesn't work, right. But, but that code up there does. Um, and so that's, that's the wrap example there. Um, list is just like maybe. There's really no difference. because we have a nice zero constructor that we can use. That still works, hopefully. Um, unit is very straightforward. And then arrow is sort of strange, but there's nothing all that unusual about it under the hood. So arrow is a type that takes two arguments, unlike list or maybe. Right, so list takes one argument, maybe takes one argument. Arrow, as a type, it takes two. In this case, A and B. Um, and so we can, we can form the type just like that. And I'm pretty sure I heard whispers of the correct sort of word that we need to use in the answer. What's, the, what's a zero function? How can, we, how can we build a zero function? Const, yeah. So, we don't care what the argument is. We do care what the result is. So this is just going to be the constant function that returns the zero of the result.
Um, and so, so here we have this whole sort of plethora of different types that we can return based on, on sort of what we, what we can pattern match on. Questions about this? Yes? When I try to create an S wrap in order to test this with, it says that I, I can't do it because I have a constraint of anything. OK. Am I missing something there? So let's, let me, let's just uh, do this so we can see what we're doing in the end. Um, so if I say, I'm not sure exactly what you tried, but if I say 0 of S wrap of, say, S bool, Oh, no instance for show. But I said there should be an instance for show. Oh, oh yeah. If it's a, yeah, an int is going to have a. No, well, you wouldn't. You wouldn't call s wrap on ten, right? Because because when you the the argument to s wrap, to, so when you call zero, right? You, it has to be one of these s tie things. Yeah, yeah. It has to be this type representation. Other questions. Oh, sure. Yeah, sorry, it scrolled off. One sec. No. Ah, there we go. You can't derive show on that? Um, you can derive show on this, but not the way that you want to. Um, so if you just say deriving show after s tie, you get an error because the, that, that deriving mechanism doesn't work for gadgets directly. But um, Haskell also has standalone deriving. And then that should work for a type like this. So I say deriving instance show s tie tie. I think that will work. Yeah. So now we have a show instance. Yes. So for all the data constructors from s maybe downwards, the left the first argument is already wrapped into the s tie. Does it have to be that way? I mean, could you just have an A2, for example, that's maybe an A2, an S tie maybe A? So, yes. Okay, this is just for this example. Right, you, you, you can. Um, it, but then you're going to get different information out. So for maybe and for list, that would work just fine because we don't need to know anything about that type that's inside. But for wrap, that wouldn't work because then here on the right-hand side of the wrap case, we'd sort of have nowhere to go. Okay, I think let's, let's move on. Um, okay, oh, back to Emacs already. Okay, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about type inference around gadgets. Um, in, in Haskell, uh, we like to often put type signatures on our functions because these are, they're good documentation, it's good double checking, uh, but there's sort of this general property that we all believe in the background that we don't really need any of these type annotations, that Haskell should just be able to infer everything. Um, and that's true when you don't enable any extensions. But we've enabled some extensions. Um, and so that's not true anymore. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to comment out everything except one bit of this. And even that one line is going to fail to compile without a type signature. Um, and so we're not going to sort of plumb the depths of this error message. I will just point out that it complains about T being untouchable. <laughs> um, I could give a long lecture about what exactly that means. I'm not going to do that. What we care about is when you see that error, it means add a type signature. Um, that's sort of the, 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 whenever you're working with gadgets, you will encounter untouchable problems. And 90% of the time, the answer is add a type signature somewhere. At least, if that doesn't fix the real problem, that will get you a better error message so that you can figure out what the real problem is. Um, but there's a good reason for this. It's not just that GHC isn't smart enough or that no one's bothered to implement this. It's really impossible. Um, and that's because 0, as written with just this one equation, there's two possible types that it could have. And there's no way to know which one is right. It's actually more than just two, but there's sort of two obvious ones. Uh, the first is the one that we were giving it which we know already, that's a perfectly valid type for this, is for this zero. So that compiles with warnings about missing patterns. Um, but the other type that I could give is this one. And that will also compile. 
Um, and you know, at a first glance, it might look like having a tie here instead of bool at the end. Let me write them both next to each other. It might look like the second one is somehow is better than the first because it looks more general. But it's not actually more general. Um, this, this second one, for example, I could, um, wait, I want to talk about the first one. This one could become something like this. Right, if I instantiate tie with int, I can, I, can, I can specialize the first one to s tie int to bool, whereas the second one does not specialize there. And so that means that these two types, there's not one that's more general than the other. They are incomparable. Um, and so there's no way GHC is going to choose between them, so it won't choose. Yes? Um, this seems like a very significant cliff for Haskell to jump off, because it's, it's literally sacrificing principal typing. I yes. Mean, I, I know it's not the only place where Haskell sacrifices principal typing, but I mean, I, how, how, how seriously was that trade-off considered? Um, I, well, I, I think it depends on, on, on what you're saying. So we have not sacrificed that for Haskell 98 or the Haskell without any extensions. Sure. And, and so, uh, you know, at least my thought as someone who adds extensions to Haskell is that we need to keep sort of that core working. Um, but this gives us a lot of expressivity. Um, and generally, you can get there just with top-level annotations, which in practice most, prog most Haskell programmers use a lot of anyway. Um, and so it's sort of a pragmatic standpoint of this actually doesn't bite so much in, in, in practice, and so it's okay. Um, you know, how much was this considered? You know, I know it's, it's in the papers about gadgets, they definitely talk a lot about, oh, we're losing principal types here. Yes? Just to add, I think Richard is going to like to say it, but the thing is, with principal typing, it's a very, very lucky coincidence. It's not lucky, it doesn't come out by luck, it's brilliant. But the moment you start doing fancy things with your type system, of the kind that Richard is showing, you have to pretty much take principal typing in the file. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Sorry, for, for those of us who don't know what this means, uh, you want to tell me what principal type means. Sure. sure. Yeah. So a, a, a principal type means that when you write down an expression, there is one best type that you can, as, uh, that you can assign to that expression. And when I say best, I mean most general, more than any other type that you could give. So if I write the function, um, if I write that, for example, the best type is a to a. But another perfectly good type is int to int. Um, but the principal type property means that there is a best. And for when you have gadgets, that's not true anymore. Um, so to, to be clear, it's not the only language feature in Haskell that prevents you from having principal typing. There, there's other ways to, there, there's other things that sing it. It's just, this is the, this is the one that just completely backs off the deep end. Because um, Haskell's type system, even without extensions, is, is <coughs> It's, it's in the system app category. It's not actually in the, uh, in the Nova uh, category because of um, for all. So I guess it, actually for all requires an extension, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So if you're thinking of sort of higher rank types, yeah. which I'll touch on right at the end of the talk, but um, yeah, that also gets rid of this, gets rid of principal types, but that's not Haskell 98. No, it's a good point. Yeah. Um, there's polymorphic recursion, which does some weird things, but I don't know if we're going to go there now. That might, I don't know if that's in the Haskell report or not. Yes? So you kind of explained what principal type is. Why, why do we need or want that? So, so I think originally when, when the idea of principal types sort of started and the, the Henley-Milner type system came out, which is what Haskell is based on and what OCaml is based on, it, the idea of being able to write a program without any types at all in it was very attractive. That you know, you could just write it, and it would be a strongly typed program, but you don't write any types. Um, and I think that the programming community has moved past that in some regards now, and that we realize types are good documentation, um, and it's okay to put them in. So the, what's interesting about principal types is it means you can write a program without any type information, and it still is well typed with a very specific meaning, and it doesn't depend on sort of guesses that the compiler might make. I forget if it was Pierce or Harper that said, the more interesting your types are, the less fun they are to write down. Oh, it's Pierce. Yeah, sure. I, I have a question, maybe this is a random digression, but um, does principal typing guarantee that you have a decidable algorithm for computing that most general type? I don't think it. I mean, I, uh, 
I mean, the statement of printable types doesn't really talk about an algorithm for it. So I don't know if it does that. I, but I haven't thought about that. Um, OK, let's, let's, um, let's plot forward. So, uh, so we saw that untouchable uh, variables mean you need to add a type annotation. One, one thing I'd like to point out in case someone's thinking it back there is you know, here, it almost looks like that has a principal type. Right? Because we, on the right of the arrow, uh, the return type, it can't be bool. It can't be int. It has to be something else. Well, it turns out that Haskell has these things called type families, which allow you to do even stranger things in types. And in the presence of that possibility, this still doesn't have a principal type, even if you have multiple equations. So the bottom line is, when you're doing a Gadget pattern match, you don't have principal types. And that's why you need the type annotation. Um, OK. Let's see. What's coming up next? Um, so once again, this is the takeaway from that little section. If you see t is untouchable, add a type signature. Um, so the next um, uh, element of Haskell that's good to know about when you're thinking about Gadget programming is the scoped type variables extension. Um, this isn't something we're actually going to uh, exercise too much uh, today. But you, if you play around with this, you'll need this. And here we have two different functions. Um, and in some sense, they look pretty similar. We have up there, we have the foo function, which takes some argument of type A. We'll call it x. And then there's this felper. And felper also has type A. What's strange is that in Haskell, felper and x have different types, even though they're both called A. And that's because what G, when GHC sees the type signature of felper, it, it thinks you mean for all A, A. So like, it would be hard to give a concrete value to Felper there, right? Because it could be anything. It really sort of has to be undefined. Um, in bar, if we have the scoped type variables extension enabled, the only difference between bar and foo is that I, I've written for all a after the colon there. And what that means is that a is lexically scoped. So in the body of bar, including in, in, in the where there, we have that it's the same a. So indeed, here, Belper and x will have the same type. Um, and so if, say, you have a helper function inside that does some sort of Gadget pattern matching and you need to give it a type signature, this distinction is really important. And this can sync you quickly if you don't know about it, um, which is why I'm putting it here, because it's, 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 a, it's a really bad gotcha. And this is one of the very few extensions that GHC does not tell you to enable. It'll just say, you're wrong, and smile at you. And then you have to go up and add scope type variables, and then it'll work. Um, and so be, be, be aware of that. So sure, so in foo, the two a's are just considered totally independent of one another. Um, and so it doesn't know that there's any relationship between Felper and that argument x. Whereas just by adding the for all in the bottom example, GHC then does scoping. And it actually brings that a into scope so that when I refer to it in, in the type of Belper, I get the type that I want. So the first one, the second a scope starts in the where clause. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, it sort of starts at the double colon. And if we add scope type variables, the top one will be the same thing as the bottom one? No. So with scope type variables on, this is the behavior. The scope type, you need to enable the extension and write the for all A to get it to work. Yes? Um, I agree with you. <laughs> um, and, and you know, I've seen people say, shouldn't just scope type variables be on by default? And then there's a lot of people say, no, but that's not in the standard. The standard says they should have different types. And these are both, they're both good arguments. I'm not actually, I, I don't even know which one I agree with between those, because I'm a big proponent of standards and, and adhering to them. Yes? So, uh, you go first, yeah. So, so what, can you just omit the, the Type signature of helper, then why, 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 why do you have to have that line over there? So, so the reason to have a type signature is let's say this was a, a more complicated example where, where these helper functions did a Gadget pattern match. Mm -hmm. So then they'd need a type signature, and we might need to connect it with the, with the overall type. Okay. Right. So uh, yeah, we need a much bigger example to see why. If you plumb the source code of the Glamda example, it's used a bunch of times. Yes? I was going to say, is it a true statement that the first one is equivalent to saying, 
where it fell for a cone cone B? Yes. Yes. Is the for all necessary in this example to, if you were using the edits? Because I've used script type available before. It may have been a happy accident <coughs> because I did have the type signature and aware clause for documentation and without script type variables, you know, the, the outer function and inner function did have the same types. But I didn't have to specify the for all in that case. But it wasn't using gadgets. <coughs> It's not to do with gadgets. The scope type variables does more than just this. There's other ways of bringing type variables into scope, so it, it sort of depends on the details. And, and sometimes you don't need the inner helper to have the same type as the outer one, and it'll still type check. Okay. Um, so it sort of just depends on the details. Yes? Is there any way you could get scope type variables without having a higher rank type? So because the type of bar is different than the type of foo. Like, that, that's not the same type. Um, I would disagree with you there. I would say they are the same type. So this is bar, bar is a value of type for all a, a to a, whereas foo is a value for all a, a to a. Mm. So, so I think we, we, can, we can debate this afterward, but. So you have to instantiate the type a in foo when you get the value foo. With bar, you don't have to instantiate that type. So you, you basically move the for all one arrow over. It's just that Haskell hides that arrow. Um, That's why for all is a higher rank. No, but in this case, there's no parentheses here. So this isn't, bar is not higher rank. He, he wrote the for all in CDEF form. Which yeah. This thing is the case of your for all is after an arrow. Yeah, yeah. after an hour or after an open parenthesis or something else. Anyway, we can talk more about it afterward. But I, yeah. Sure. Um, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's see what's coming up next. Ah, dreaded bug 3927. <laughs> Um, okay, let me undo some of these changes so we're back to a working state here. Okay. Does that compile? Yes, good. Um, okay, so let's say I want to write an equality function on s tie here. Uh, so I'll do this. Um, Okay, and let's, I'm going to make things a lot simpler by getting rid of a lot of this stuff. We don't need any of this stuff for this example. Okay. I know I'm not done yet, but let's see what happens here. So I'm going to get a pattern matches are non-exhaustive. Um, if you're trying this on your own computers, you might not see that because this warning isn't enabled by default. It is on my GHCI because I can't live without it. Um, but you may need to sort of do a, if you put this in your file, you'll see this. You'll get the, you'll get the warnings that we're talking about. Um, so it says that I'm, I'm missing some patterns. Oh, so I'm missing yes maybe. Okay, let me add the yes maybe pattern. <coughs> Um, and I compile. Oh, now it's complaining about more missing patterns. So let me add the first one. And I did exactly what GHC told me to do, but now it's telling me my code is inaccessible. This is terrible. This is really annoying. But the, the so, so, so GHC is right. This code is inaccessible in this last equation. Because what's happening is, is that when I pattern match on the first argument and I get s int, I learn that tie is int. When I pattern match on the second argument with s bool, I learn that tie is bool. And GHC is smart enough to know that tie can't be both int and bool. And so it says that this clause will never, ever, ever happen. And that's 100% correct. So the error is right. The warning that you get when you don't have this, that I'm missing clauses, is bogus. Um, and it turns out that for reasons I haven't fully plumbed, this, is, this was a very hard bug to fix and has been around. So right now, GHC bugs are numbered in sort of 10,400 10, range. And this is in the 3,000. So it's been around a while. Um, but uh, this fall at ICFP, 
um, there is a paper that, that proposes the solution to this problem. So I think we can expect this to go away in 7.12. If you start programming with gadgets before then, expect to see this. Um, and so you'll get warnings and then you have to try it out. It turns out that this eek s tie that I've written here is actually really silly. Um, because by the type signature, I can see that the answer has to be true. I've used the same type index twice. There's, no, there's nothing I can pass to eek s tie that, that should give me false. Um, uh, so it's a silly example, but this comes up in, in more realistic examples also. Um, so what, what I do when I see this, because I don't want to trust myself, I only sort of want to trust the computer checking all of my code, is every pattern that it tells me to try, I will write it in my code and make sure that I get the inaccessible code warning or error, um, which is really annoying, and I'm looking forward to not having to do that. Um, yes? Could you replace this with underscores just so it wasn't like a, a set type? Would it compile? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. So. Um, just to demonstrate that, and that's, that's in fact what I do in the end, is <laughs> is that. Um, and you'll actually see, a, there's, there's one or two places in the Lambda source code that that comes up. Um, and that really should never ever happen. This is not a runtime error. This is, this is like something else. This is just code that won't ever happen. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, so with that, oh, heterogeneous lists. Great. Um, we're going to open up a new file for that. So one problem that sometimes people complain about in, in sort of functional languages like Haskell is that, we, um, is that lists are really sort of constrained, that they always have to just have a whole bunch of the same thing. Uh, and it can be useful to have a heterogeneous list. And once again, I forgot language. Um, and so we can do that using gadgets quite nicely. And let me write in the definition here, and then we'll explain, go over how this is working. Whoops, that's wrong. Okay, this won't compile because I'm missing a whole bunch of extensions, which I believe are these. And let's put that in just for good measure. Okay. Um, so what on earth is going on here? Um, so what we have here is we have this type H list, uh, which is an indexed type. So, so just like a list would take, would take the type of all of its elements, well, an H list, we can't give one thing that's going to be the type of all of its elements because we want this to be heterogeneous. We want this to be able to store ints and bools and cars um, in them. And so we have to give a whole list of types that will correspond to the actual data elements that are around at runtime. So just to demonstrate this, um, let's see. Let's do that deriving show. Um, Oh, never mind. Let's not derive show. That's not going to work out at all. <laughs> it would, but it would take a lot more effort to get that to work. So we're not going to do that. Instead, we are going to do this. We're just going to ask, is this well typed? And it will say yes. So we can add true, and then, oh, maybe unit, and then maybe a list of um, just some character, and then we can put a string in. Of course, we have to terminate. And it says, yes, that is well typed. And it's well typed as an H list indexed by the list of all of the types of the elements. Um, and so what's going on here, so, so, so uh, there's a couple of other extensions that are, that are at play. Um, and that is that we're, we're using what are called promoted data types. So Haskell has all of these nice data types. So we can have the list type, for example, and you can make lists. But with promoted data types, now we can actually use lists in types. And the way that it works is you just put a little tick mark before the thing, and then now you can use it in the type. So this just sort of extends our, our syntax of types a little bit. Um, and so here, 
when I'm saying H list and then tick with empty brackets, um, what, I'm, what I'm really saying is that this nil is a data constructor that creates an H list where the list of types of the elements is empty. That's because there are no elements. It's the empty list. Um, when I do the cons operator here, I'm going to take something of this type H and then the tail, a list of uh, a heterogeneous list where each element in the list is described by the types in the list T. And then what do I get? I get a heterogeneous list that the first element in the type index is H, followed by the list of the other types in the list, of elements in the list. Yes. Yeah. And also a bunch of other things like just and nothing and true and false. So you, it's sort of simple data types, but interestingly, not gadgets themselves, you can do this with. So that's type operators or data kinds? That's data kinds. Type operators is there for the, just for the colon because that, that's an operator used in a type. Um, uh, but the, to get the tick working is data kinds. Okay. Yes. Um, so, just say that one more time. So we went like one level up, it's data kinds, right? And I'm just trying to make sure that I understand it right. So sure. This works because bool, unit, da 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 da, they're all kind star. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So if we wanted to circumscribe it to something more similar to the star, then we'd have to create our own kind and then specify that or something? Yes, but you, you, that wouldn't really make sense for a heterogeneous list because things of other, other than kind star don't have values to sort of put in the term level list. So in this case, we don't want to do that. But there's sort of only so far this trick goes. Um, and so when I said earlier at the beginning of the talk that there's some things that are going to happen in 7.12, right now sort of this promotion trick works only once. You can promote one level. Um, with, in 7.12, if everything works the way it should, you'll be able to sort of promote as many times as you want, essentially. Um, if, if that comment went over your head, just don't worry about it. It's not really all that germane to the talk. Um, okay, so we have this heterogeneous list. Other, uh, other questions about this definition that I've written up here? Does the tick work with cons because cons is a destructor? Yes. Okay. And does it work with sort of any types or is it only predefined? It works with, 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 with sufficiently simple types. Okay, so it can be one you made up yourself. It can be one you made up yourself. Okay. Um, and my experience is unless you've done a lot of Haskell type theory, it's hard to for people to predict what sufficiently simple is. <laughs> Maybe is sufficiently simple, bool is sufficiently simple, s tie is not. OK. Um, so, so we have this list. We'd like to be able to extract from it. Um, so I'm going to write a get function. And so we want some number. And then we're going to take some h list, which has some index. And then, well, hard to know exactly what this is returned, so I'll just leave that blank for now. And then so if, if the number is 0 and I have some x cons onto x's, I just want to return x. And so I, I know there's a little bit more work to do around this, but let's try that. And I'm going to get this type error. Um, and so this here, this is a, a, um, a type hole, um, which is a new feature in 7.10, which allows you to put underscores in types. Um, and so to enable that, I need to say partial type signatures. If you don't have 7.10, don't worry about this too much. This is not a central part. Um, but what it's saying is, is that I want to leave this part of the type out. GHC, you figure it out for me. And it's, in the end, it can't figure it out for me. It, it can't know what this is, right? Because we don't know what the types are in ties. We don't know what this can return, what this is going to return. And we, don't, we also don't know what number we've passed in as our int. And so that big heterogeneous list that we saw before, maybe this will return a bool, maybe it'll return a string. It depends on what int we pass in. So there's just no way this is going to work out. Um, so this is doomed to failure. So let's get rid of it. Instead, we need to make another get. Um, and let me write this one in, and then I'll go over how it works. Whoops, wrong one. So 
So the alum type um, describes how a certain uh, how a certain type can be in a list of in a type level list of types. <coughs> so E Z Z here stands for zero says that the element X is the first element in this list, which we can see because I've used X twice. ES, S stands for successor here, says that if X is an element of the list X's, then well, X is an element of the list Y const onto X's, but of course it's going to be one element later, so that's successor there. Um, and so we can, we can build these, these up. So let's, let's look at an example. Um, I can say, for example, that if I have the type level list bool int, hmm? oh, I didn't compile. <coughs> mm. Oh. Uh, I should. I need to have the word element. There we go. So what 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 we have here is that I can say easy, and that's that shows me that bool is the first the, or the zeroth element of this list. Or I could say e s e z. That's lm same list int. And so now this gives us enough power that we can actually index into our heterogeneous list. Um, and so that will look like this. Um, so we want to write a get function that uses this lm type to index in because now if I know that a certain type tie is in my list of ties, then I'll be able to look in my H list and then get the tie out. Um, and so that is exercise two, is to write get. Um, which you'll see. So, so I, I fully expect that a lot of you are sort of mystified about all of this right now. <laughs> but it turns out that there's, there's sort of only one way to do this. And, and it, it's not so hard to just sort of follow along the garden path. And, and, and you'll get there. Um, and so. Let's see. Hopefully that's my next slide is the exercise. Yes, it is. There we are. OK. So, so we'll do that now. I'm looking at the time. And there's been a lot of great questions. It slowed things down a little bit. But I, but I think that's been good. So if you feel the need for a break, now might be the good time to do that. And then we'll go over the solution to get. If you want to try it, do that. Uh, and then I think we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes. But uh, I, I think it, it will be to everyone's advantage to sort of overlay, these th overlay the break with exercise two. So here we go. Um, I said at the beginning that you sort of follow your nose through it. Um, and, and well, the first thing that, we, that we're going to do is, is pattern match on what we've got here. So we have an alum, so let's do a pattern match. Um, and then the H list, well, if I want the zero with element, well, I'm going to have to pattern match on the H list as well. So it's going to look like that. And then let's just leave that out for now. Does the first part compile? Ooh, it does. That's good. And then here, well, if I, if, if I have a successor, that means that my element is somewhere later in the list. So I'm going to pattern match on the H list like that. And then recur. OK, so it says that my pattern matches are non-exhaustive. But let's see what happens here. I don't even know what I do in that case. Ah, I get an error saying inaccessible code, right? We know if, if I have one of these elem objects, then by the way that elem is constructed, I know that the list can't be empty, right? Because both constructors for elem, both ez and es, lead me to a case where my list has at least that one element. And so I don't have to worry about the nil case. So this get function is actually total, and I don't have to worry about sort of missing. So yeah, so the, the reason that we got that warning was, is that same bug that, that should hopefully be fixed soon. Um, but it took you know, 
12 very densely typeset pages of mathematics to get there. Um, um, I, don't think, I, I don't think it was a, that by itself was a PhD. Um, so, um, okay, so there's, there's get. Uh, I'm going to transition from here to talk more about this Glambda interpreter. And um, this, this interpreter uses gadgets a lot. We're only going to be able to see a slice of it in this workshop. But um, as, as I was creating it, it sort of more and more features popped out of it that make it a sort of a good case study for learning about gadgets. So um, my, my hope is to sort of spend more time over the summer actually writing a bunch of blog posts and tutorials about it because there's a lot of different things that, that, that are in there. Um, which I didn't realize at all when I started doing it, but it just sort of came together nicely. Anyway, let's, let's, let's take a look at, at what it is. Um, so this is actually a package that's released on Hackage right now. Yes? Can you show get to actual Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I never think about running my programs. I just type check. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't. Um, sure, so I can say get easy on the list uh, true followed by hello followed by just five, which is an int. Let's not play around with overloaded numbers. And that will get true. Or I can do that, and it gets hello. Yeah, it actually does work when you run it. <laughs> um, OK. So, whoops. Um, okay, so here's the Lambda interpreter. It's, um, it, it, is, it is a basic, simply typed Lambda calculus interpreter, but hopefully people are somewhat familiar with the idea of Lambda calculus if this is Lambda conf. Um, but I'll, I'll, show, I'll show a few examples. Um, so what, what it can do, you know, very basic things, right? It can, it can add. Um, it can do conditionals. Um, it can, we can write a function. And it will do that. Um, and so just to explain what's going on here, so I've, I've defined this lambda function here, and I'm applying it to the number 2. Um, the other thing that we see here is I have given a type to my x. This is not do type inference. So all, every time you have a lambda, you have to label it uh, explicitly. Um, uh, and I can also define constants. So here, this is reverse application. Um, so I'll explain a little bit more about what that output is in a, in a minute. Um, but here I can define reverse application. I can define the plus 1 function, which looks like that. And then sure enough, all of these things work together. So, so it sort of gets you off the ground. It gets you sort of you can do a little bit with it. Um, just to show that it's not totally brain dead, um, my test for language is can it figure out prime numbers? And this can figure out prime numbers knows that that is true, but that one's false. Um, and, and so uh, the other, uh, another feature of it that will come into play a little bit later is that we can actually see this happen step by step. So I can step revap 5 plus 1, and it shows us this thing reducing at every step, which is pretty cool. Um, and of course, it can tell us the type of things with colon type. Or we could just do colon t, 5, that's it. Um, you can do that step thing with the is prime also, but that's a lot of steps. Um, OK, so, so this thing, it's, it's, it's working. Um, uh, the one thing I'd like to draw everyone's attention to is what I'm doing with, with variable binding here. Um, I don't know if anyone has, has looked at it. How many people in here have heard of de Brown indices? Oh, oh wow, that's like a whole ton more than I expected. Um, so the idea is, is that when I write a function, so we'll see, um, oh, it's already scrolled off. Um, when, I, when I wrote my rev app function, I labeled the different parameters, or the different, uh, yeah, parameters x and y. But the, the choice of x and y is totally incidental there. Um, and in the implementation of an interpreter, it's really annoying to have variable names. 
uh, because maybe somewhere else there's some other function that talks about some other variable x. And in the course of evaluation, maybe I'm going to do some substitutions and these x's collide and then I have to go and rename one of them to x1. Right? We see this all the time in GHC error messages when our type variables change from a to a0 and things like that to avoid collision. Um, and so what I've done here is I've used this, this convention called de Brown indices, which instead of storing the name, I just store sort of how many lambdas I have to jump over to get to that variable. And so here in the definition of RevApp, we see that y has become number zero because I, ha I don't jump over any lambdas to get to the y because it's the one that's right here. The x, to get to the x, I have to jump over one lambda. So it's number one. Yes? How did you get the colors to line up to that and how can I make that work? <laughs> like, uh, I've used the brown notation before and it's always this massive pain because you're like counting and like trying to remember where your parentheses are. And... It's just a little logic in the pretty printer. There, very, there... very impressive. <laughs> when, that was another thing that came out of this when I was, I was like, ooh, this is a great way to learn about de Brown indices. It's, it's um, yeah, it's just, it's actually a tiny little bit of magic. I mean, it's, it, it, it's remarkably straightforward to get that to work when you try to. Um, so just to sort of drive this point home, I have one example here that I'll type in. What this does is not important at all. But I wanted to show an example of when you have a variable that's used sort of both within a binder and outside of a binder. Um, and so here, this x, it's bound out here. Um, but then it's used inside of this function that's, that's abstracted over y and then again outside of it. So in the output here, um, we see that here, to talk about x, I have to jump over one lambda. And here, I don't have to jump over any lambdas, right? Because this, this other one over here is sort of internal. We don't really jump over that one. Um, but the, we can see in the colors sort of how this all lines up. Um, OK, so that's, that's the lambda interpreter. Yes? Sorry, dumb question. But, but so you're, there's no two different x's in that case, even though you didn't introduce a new x? No, they're the same x. Okay. They're the same x, but, in the, yeah, but, but depending on the context, the de Brown indices are different. So de Brown indices are terrible for humans, great for computers. Um, and so as humans, ignore the numbers and just look at the colors. Um, OK, other questions? Um, OK, so let's look at the code behind all of this. So in particular, I want to look at, wait a sec, I want to not forget to do an important thing. Which I did forget, and that's to change branches. Great. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the expression type within Glambda, and what's interesting about this expression type? Oh, there's there's Elm again. By the way, that's one of the reasons that we worked in Elm before because we have to use it in here. Um, relates, as you might imagine, quite closely to these de Brown indices. Um, so the idea within Glambda is that after you, know, you take that text and we have to lex it and parse it and process it a little bit, but once we've type checked it, I didn't show you an example of something that was type incorrect, but there is a type checker. If you type in something wrong, it will tell you so. Um, uh, then it will eventually produce this exp type. And the exp type, through the magic of Gadgets, can only store well-typed expressions. There is no way of building you know, the expression of one applied to two here, right? Um, so just to sort of drive that home, let me switch back. If I run glam, if I type one, two, of course that's no good, right? I can't apply one as a function. Well, this exp type that I have, um, it, will, it won't even allow me to create such a thing. Um, and so, uh, the, 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 by virtue of that, I know that my type checker has to be correct that I've written in this language, uh, in this interpreter. There's no way I could have made a mistake in the type checker because I couldn't create an ill-typed expression in this, in this expression language. So let's, let's sort of plumb through how that all works. Um, <laughs> whoops, don't do that. 
Oh no. Never mind. Forget all of this stuff. Okay. We'll use highlighting instead of spacing. Um, so we'll start with the easy constructors. Int E and, and bully. So these are, these are my literals. And what they're saying is, so int E takes an int, and then it gives me back an exp ctx int. So exp takes two different type indices. The first one is a context, which is the list of the types of all of the bound variables at this, in this expression. Right, so at any given point, as I'm looking at an expression, there's a bunch of lambdas that I may have seen, maybe none. And I need to know the types of all the variables bound in those lambdas. Um, and so that is this CTX. So this is just a list of types, just like we saw in HList. Um, and you'll see up here I'm using a, a sort of a different way of writing X, uh, of writing the, the sort of the header here. And I'm using what's called a kind signature. And star is the way that we write the kind of types in Haskell. So we could just think of int is a star and maybe bool is a star, right? But maybe by itself is a star arrow star because it's not really a type. It needs another type to become one. Um, and so here, the first index to exp is a list of types. And then the second one is a type. So here, I've said in any context, an integer literal is an int. Great. For the bool constructor, in any context, a, a Boolean literal is a bool. Um, the next one I want to look at is app. So this is, this is for function application. So we're going to take two expressions and apply one to another. The first expression has to, have, so it has to be valid in some context CTX. I don't care too much about it. And it's going to have type arg arrow res. It's going to be some function from some argument type to some result type. The next expression also has to be well typed in that same context, but it has type arg, the argument type. And then, of course, what's the, what's the result of this? Well, it's going to be an expression that's well typed in that same context of type res. If any of these pieces don't line up, then I won't be able to use the app constructor. So every time I use the app constructor, it's checking to make sure that indeed I have a function that I can apply to this argument. Um, let's look at lamb for a sec. So this is, the, this is the, the kind of expression, this is a lambda expression. And so a lambda expression, the body of the lambda is some expression, but that expression, it's not in the same context. It has one other variable available to it of some type arg. So I extend the context by consing arg onto ctx here. And so I take, I take whatever my outer context is and I add one, one more type to it called arg. And then, of course, that gives me an expression that's well typed in the context of type arg arrow res. So that, this is how sort of the functions are created. Um, in the variable case, well, I'm going to pick out what variable I want, which is going to be one of these types that are in my context. So I use this elem to sort of say, to, to indicate which type it is in my context. And of course, elem is just a, is essentially a natural number, right? It's zero or some sequence of successors on, on that. And so, ah, getting scrolling to work in Emacs is always interesting. Um, so we can, con and we can convert one of these into an int. So actually this elem to int is used when I'm printing out those de Brown indices in the output of the program. Um, and so it's saying that if I have the right elem construct to pick out a type tie for my context, well, then that's a well-typed expression in that context of that type. Um, the last pieces here are, we can have an arithmetic expression. So this is plus or minus or uh, an equality comparison, perhaps. Um, and so here I know that, that in this language, all of my arithmetic operators operate over ints. I, um, I don't have and or or. So here I take some int, some arithmetic expression that's going to give me a result of type tie, another int, and then it gives me my result. And then we can see for conditionals, I take some bool, two things of the same type tie, and then I get a final result of type tie. And so if there's any mismatch anywhere, I won't be able to construct one of these things. Um, 
And, and so that's sort of the, 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 the key insight here is that I can use gadgets to do this. And the way that that's useful is, say, in writing the evaluator. Because I know my evaluator has to be well typed. As I produce, go, go from what, uh, uh, an expression down to a value, then it's got to work out. So here, I'll give you, I'll let you know now that exercise three is writing the evaluator. Um, which, again, follow your nose. You can't really do it wrong. Um, well, at least if it type checks, you can't do it wrong. So here, what you're going to be writing is a function from that x type up here to this val type. So values are always top level. They don't have a context. So we don't have to worry about contexts here. There's three kinds of values. You can either have an int, which is, of course, of type int over here. You can have a Boolean, which is of type bool. Or you can end up with some lambda expression that isn't yet applied, so we can't evaluate it any further. So a lambda expression is some expression. Um, and then uh, with, with one argument of type arg produces a type res, and then that's going to give you something of type arg arrow res. So exercise three is in the eval file. And we'll see here that here's this eval function, which you have to write. So all the instructions are, again, linked to from the, the usual GitHub page. Um, so let's do that. And that sort of brings us to the end. I have a few closing remarks. But we'll, we'll maybe have, I don't know, 10 minutes or so to, to do eval. You may not quite get there, but see if you can get maybe the first couple of constructors. I'd like to, to wrap up pretty quickly. Um, the answer to exercise three is up here. Um, did, did, was anyone able to get this? No. OK, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't surprise me. There, there really wasn't an, as much time as I wanted to have there. Um, so I'm sorry if, any, if anyone was sort of struggling against the wall on that uncomfortably. But um, one, sort of each individual piece, again, there's just, you just sort of follow the types. And, and this, this sort of the final point I have whoops, um, is about why I like gadgets. And it's, it's because of this. It's because when I'm writing my evaluator, I know once it type checks that it's got to work. Um, and it turns out that the evaluator is not at all the hardest part of this. So de Brown indices are fiddly, right? This is the algorithm that has to be used when you substitute one expression inside of another. Um, and uh, in fact, when I tried to do this without gadgets, I, I just I didn't even you know sort of know how to do it. It's 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 not that complicated. But you look at this and you and you really don't want to implement that, right? That's not a pleasant experience. But with the gadgets, there really wasn't a way I could go wrong. I didn't I didn't look that up in a book before implementing it, I just sort of typed until it type checked. And it worked out. And I knew it was going to work out because my types, my, my, my types worked. So in much the same way that when you do typed programming, you sort of have this, you, when it actually compiles, you have some confidence that it might actually work. Well, with more types, you have more confidence. So that's sort of the, my, my, my end takeaway. Um, the last thing here is just talking a little bit about how we're doing some compile time reasoning about something that's going to happen at runtime, right? That people have their own, um, their own uh, functions that they're going to write with their own types. You don't know what they are, and yet we're doing some reasoning about them. And it all comes back to the, the fact that we can use sort of higher rank types. Um, I sort of want to give people a little bit of time between sessions here. But um, here, this is the type of, of the actual type checker that takes a UX, which is a not yet type checked expression and type checks it. And here, my, my sort of the thing that processes the checked expression has to work for any type. And so that's how we can sort of reason about these things at compile time, even though they won't exist until runtime. And so I encourage you to look at the check module of this if you want to see how that happens. But a lot of the examples that use Gaddis to do this sort of thing sort of assume that you just sort of sit there and type it. Like my hlist examples, I, I was just sort of typing there in the terminal. And of course, it can type check everything because it's all obvious. Uh, but here, actually, we can type check something and then run it later. Um, and so that actually does work. Um, so here's some further reading. Um, thanks for, for sticking with me. And um, I hope this was helpful to everyone. And enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> <laughs>